younger, was terrified, was not able to do the things that they were able to do beforehand. All right, so you're gonna probably laugh. I try to make some graphics here <laughs> to show you kind of what was represented while I tell you a story. So you have something to look at, something to kind of represent. So this was over several weeks, but the client took to the sand tray and recreated scenes of figures getting married and then arguing and then separating, which is pretty clear what that probably was. Um, but each week, there was a figure buried in the center of the couple at the start, and it was never revealed. Okay. Each week, the mound of sand covering the figure became larger and larger. And when I asked the client initially, what is that? The client said, I don't know what that is which is fair. <laughs> Over several weeks, the mound became larger. The scene kept playing out. They were getting married. They were arguing. They were separating to different corners of the sand tray. And as it kept getting bigger and as they kept fighting until one day, the scenario was interrupted by the client who reached into the mound, pulled the figure out that was hiding and said, that's enough. The client stated the figure was in fact hiding the client held the figure and stated, I have been watching you and you can't hide anymore. The figure then became a central star to many imaginative scenarios and the parent play ceased. So no more getting married, no more arguments, no more separations. They just became parts of this person this figure is now going to have superpowers and run the world. It was very imaginative play and very age appropriate. The toilet training returned to previous levels of achievement and engagement in the activities returned to the previous levels before the estrangement. So the child began to engage in her sing-along uh, Spanish class and also be able to engage in um, the, um, the swimming lessons and a variety of different things. Toilet training returned to where they had gotten the client prior, and so everything returned back to that, indicating that it had been processed and worked out, okay? I'm trying to check the chat to see if there's any questions. Okay. All right, so I'm trying to tell the stories with a little bit of excitement. So, oh, I forgot, here's the, here's the, Graphic for that, basically the aha moment where the client did better. Yay. All right, case number two. <clears throat> We're gonna look at role play. All right, is there any questions about the sand tray? Maybe that's a good place to ask. Okay, then we can have time at the end too to have discussions on different things. Um, so I just want to make sure, oh, well, maybe there is. That um, possibly, I think other people can hear me. So you may need to play with the audio on your computer setting, not sure. Okay, all right, so I'll go into the second, the second client here. Oh, that was powerful treatment for this child, uh, Michelle said. Are there other ways to use the sand tray? Uh, absolutely, I use the sand tray in a large variety of ways. I even actually have an adult sand tray, but adults tend to um, scoff sometimes at things. So um, I have what's called a, um, what they call a meditation, the um, Zen garden that has a little rake has little rocks and things of that nature. And I have just, you know, some miscellaneous items laying around uh, next to it. Um, and I usually have that on my coffee table kind of sitting area in front of the couch. And so I have a lot of adults who don't want to do sand tray work in the Zen garden. <laughs> so um, what I tell 
parents of children is that it's my job to make sure the child doesn't really know they're really at therapy. So sometimes that works with adults too. They don't always need to know they're working in the sand tray in order for it to be a powerful um, activity for them. It can help them soothe themselves. It can help them focus on different things. It can help give them a way to look at different things while they tell you something very powerful. And it can also um, just be used to help with their anxiety. So there's a lot of really great ways to do that. Now my sand tray for kids is blue and sparkly, the sand, because that really um, engages a lot of them for that. Um, for the adults, it is blue, but it is a little Zen garden. It has some uh, beachy themes. So they can make it water and they can make it a beach. It has like little logs, has little rocks, and there's like a little turtle, a little crab, things like that. So um, people, you know, see different things in it, but they can work with that. Okay. <clears throat> yes, in terms of small polished rocks, people, adults really do respond to tactile items just as much as children do. And, um, and so it can be very powerful. And yes, the colored sand I think is super important. I personally like the sparkly blue. That's why I've got a lot of background here in terms of sparkly blue. In terms of what we're dealing with in terms of the unconscious and manifestations from that, we often associate it with what's under the surface of water, like what's in the deep ocean of our souls and our consciousness and things of that nature in our minds. What are we going through and processing? What gets brought to the surface? So I think blue tends to also uh, work for that metaphor. It also is a very soothing, calming color. Um, you know, the reactions you get out of red might be far more uh, aggressive and ripping than you might want, but blue tends to be a very soothing. So even if the child or the adult just has a moment where they're able to soothe their own concerns or emotional state through the use of stand and, and tactile, that's still a very powerful therapeutic tool. How do I determine which therapy to use with each child? Well, that's kind of a, um, it's kind of a hit or miss. I have a couple of, uh, I have these things available in my office. And so whatever they tend to gravitate towards, I tend to use. And so, um, you know, a lot of people will spend a lot of time planning each session out. I spend a lot of time just planning what's available in my office. And so when they choose that item, it's already set up to do the work that I'm hoping to. And so they decide what they choose. So I have like an easel that has paper on it with like markers already in a cup. So if they want to draw, they grab that. Um, I have the sand tray um, and then I have the figures right next to the sand tray and there's a little child sized chair and they can sit down and they can play in the sand tray. Um, like I said, for the adults, I have the little Zen garden just sitting nicely on the coffee table within reach for them. Um, for um, <clears throat> Some things I have a little bit more hidden like clay and um, but I offer it. I offer it to them. I also have space in my office to be able to do things like role play. So that's uh, the next one we're going to get into and then we'll answer some more questions. Great questions. Thank you. I think that's right. Okay. So imaginative role play. And so this kind of gets into with Santre when I talked about how in theory, the clinician is a client observer. Santre as I was in that specific, specifically in that case, it was far more of an observer. Uh, I was using interpretation. I was allowing the client to work out what they needed to work out uh, with not a lot of interruption or um, information from me. And I was interpreting what was occurring. But with role play, I definitely have to be a participant. Okay, and so imagine if role play can be a very creative outlet for clients to express what has occurred, to manifest what they, he what they feel. And so what we call in this through union or psychodynamic theory is there's a self-healing archetype and that through this uh, phenomenological experience, the child can enhance that. And so basically by working through role play and through expression, they can help heal themselves, which is reconciling the meaning of the symbol and asking what it means, externalizing, and then being able to kind of determine what that means and put it in its place in a proper way. So for this case, client was four years of age and was, a vicious, and was viciously attacked by a trusted dog in the face and head. It was not a, um, 
oops, you got too close or a warning. It was, she almost lost her eye. Okay, the client had several stitches and several street treatments um, surrounding scar development. It was, it was really bad. Um, the parents were present. They had witnessed it. They had intervened swiftly. And so most likely they saved um, most of her, her face and her eyes, what they were told. Um, the child regressed in terms of being able to sleep alone and was often terrified at night, which makes sense, right? That's a pretty awful thing to happen. All right, so trying to show you this. I tell you the story. I, I forgive my drawing. <laughs> this is not the actual drawing. I gave you a representation uh, through my artistic ability. And let me explain to you who, who this Tyrex Gator is. So the client was shy and quiet and often repeated that sleeping alone at night was just not an option. <clears throat> And once I worked with the client enough for her to trust me a bit, the client shared that a monster resided in the bedroom closet of her bedroom, rendering the room uninhabitable at night. The description of the monster that the client was able to share with me um, was a figure and an image that contained numerous amounts of teeth. When asked, the client was able to um, describe the monster as an alligator, but also a Tyrex. So I said, a Tyrex gator, and the client said, absolutely. So I asked the client, can you name, does this Tyrex gator have a name? And the client told me it was Tony, Tony the Tyrex gator. Um, so after obtaining some more information about this monster, I was able to provide some validation. Of course, there's a lot of teeth with a Tyrex gator. That is definitely something to be afraid of that's in your closet. Um, but as we kind of discussed how this was very scary, how many teeth were involved, what Tony the Tyrex gator looked like, um, what Tony acted like, what are the things that Tony did, um, you know, we kind of talked about things and I mentioned man, if only you had some powers, then we would know what to do. And the client responded with, I have blue powers. And so basically I said, well, that changes everything. And so over the next uh, four sessions, uh, we did role play in which the, uh, me as Tony the Tyrex Gator um, and the client played out scenes where I attempted to stalk and attack and the client utilized blue powers, pow, 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 and then basically to attack and defeat the monster. And so it's important to note that each time the client used blue powers, pow, 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 Tony, as I basically died a comedic death. And so basically it would be pow, 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 and they'd be like, oh, ah, oh, oh, and I'd fall over and things of that nature. And this would repeat over and over and over in each session. Bang, 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 bang. And I would die a comedic death. It's important to try to bring in a little bit of the humorous because each time the client zapped me with blue powers, the client found it hilarious. So it was very empowering, but it also gave her a lot of power over the situation. And so I tell you, it was four sessions of this back to back to back to back. So you could say, I was very tired of being Tony the Tyrex Gator after like my, my 30th um, being murdered, <laughs> but it was worth it um, because after four weeks, the client's parents reported that the client decided that sleeping in their own room was warranted. The client um, took her father, brought him to the bedroom, opened the closet, closet door, and then used the blue powers, pow, 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 and declared that the monster was dead. And at this point, closed the closet door and said, okay, I'll sleep in my own room tonight, in which the parents were like, yes. So, <laughs> yay. Um, so the client was able to sleep in their own room. Here's the details. The client was able to sleep in their own room and initially two nights a week, but this client could not sleep anywhere but in between mommy and daddy. So this was a welcome change and began to incredibly, uh, it began to increase steadily. Basically, the only reason the child started to sleep with the parents was if there was a thunderstorm or something specifically scary about a nightmare, but it started to get to about 
able to do about five to six nights in a row and it became more of the norm for this the client to sleep in their own bed which was really exciting and where the client was before all of this happened okay. so any questions about role play i'm gonna check the chat sorry <laughs> the sound effects were a very important part of it they did not keep the dog um they could not keep the dog um they actually there were fears with everything with teeth but um the client was able to work with the grandparents dog um, and not be afraid of that dog um, how do i establish my role um, there's a lot of different ways to do that so a lot of it is trying to also be fun um, like I, I like i said before big part of working with kids is they don't need to know it's therapy um, as i tell the parents they should be coming out telling you we did a b and c and it was great and you're like well what happened and i explained to them a lot of my process um, so how i establish my role is usually just basically playing um, so so initially in the building of her trust and things of that nature is that this client probably worked in the if I remember correctly, worked in the sand tray, did coloring. Um, I get on the floor when we play games. I get on the floor when we color, depending on their age. Um, and um, so that's a lot of that. I use a lot of respectful language to them when I ask questions. Um, I also make a few jokes to kind of get in with them. Like I completely commiserate with children on how hard it is to raise parents. How sometimes teachers are difficult. Teachers teach, parents parent. That's how it is. Um, but you know, sometimes it's just the the stress we deal with, even if we're you know four. So, how do I get back off the floor? <laughs> well, I have to say the reason I can get back off of the floor is because I go to the floor several times a day. So it's a it's like a built up skill. Um, but there are smaller chairs that you could probably utilize that might be easier to get back off the floor. But you know, that's also a moment to be hilarious. And so maybe you, you roll over into your sides and you pretend to be something else like a tiger or something. You ask them what they want you to be and you can be that. But yes, the, the point is to empower the client to take control, to have power over their circumstances. We, we can't control the external world for children. Um, like I say, you know, I, my, my phrase with them is parents, parent, teachers, teach teachers teach there's no way for me to go in and tell people to change things because the solution isn't for them to learn that another adult can go in there and change the world for them it's how they can figure out what they can do about it you no know, regardless of what the circumstances are and so if we empower them to be able to figure out what they can do to overcome a situation that really kind of sets them up for whatever might come down the pike including adolescence right so is there a light conversation during the sand tray? What is the progressive progress? Um, yes, sometimes there can be. I do kind of, uh, I also kind of track what they're doing, but not to the point where I'm saying, oh, you know, you move this over here, you move this over here. Like during that conflict of the parents splitting up, I was like, oh, they got really mad at each other. You know, so I try to reflect the feeling because when all else fails, reflect a feeling, right? So sometimes um, when I see something being played out, I reflect the emotion in that. And a lot of times clients will be in there. Um, the younger ones are very blunt. They'll say, yeah. <laughs> and we're like, oh, that's good to know. I'm glad I'm keeping up. <laughs> How can you be sure they get to the right place? Um, I think what part of it is, is you have to respect the process and trust in the process, just like with, um, you know, more verbal, um, laden techniques and, and therapy with adults. Sometimes you're not entirely sure where we're going, but you know that if you can get them working internally on whatever the issue is, you trust the process. Not everybody moves as quickly as I want them to, not everybody moves as slowly as I want them to, and sometimes being able to just kind of um, allow the room for that process. My job is to hold the space for that process. I don't want to intervene too much because I want it to be their process. 
Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't transfer my power to a client. I would have them think of ways they have powers. And even if you got a little bit like, I didn't question what a blue power was. I still don't know what a blue power is, but does it matter what a blue power is? It was, it was the clients, right? So, um, so I would, I would work with them to be like, boy, um, you know, like, I would work with trying to figure out what, you know, you're really good at this or pointing out some strengths, but I would have them get there organically because we don't want them to look to other people to solve their problems. So I wouldn't want to be like, oh, it's for me. I'm going to solve your problem. That doesn't, that doesn't really help them in the long run. Do you use same techniques for children of different race? Or culture. Um, yes, and that's why it's very important that your uh, figures and your, um, so my graphic arts didn't really demonstrate that, but, or I tried to, but um, it's, it's good to, I utilize in my sand tray, I utilize a lot of animals, and I utilize a lot of um, natural items, you know, rocks, trees, flowers, things of that nature. And I do have the figures I have are, um, are more from like fairy tales, but I do try to get um, what I would call ethnically vague um, so that the client can find their representation without me defining it for them. Um, but finding some place where they feel connected, but then also they identify with. So, um, so that's, is I going to a toy? No, I utilize more of the play therapy websites and things of that nature. They tend to have more of a well-rounded uh, collection of items that are inclusive. Um, and unfortunately, um, I don't find as much inclusion in, some of the figures at Target. Um, not that we're not getting there, but not yet. So I think um, play therapy stores. There's 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 a lot. Um, there's a lot of play therapy supply, um, things of that nature. Um, have I ever done that virtually? Yes. Um, so I have done that. Obviously, a uh, sand tray is, this is difficult because they don't have a sand tray in front of them. Um, but I also, uh, but that's a great moment for them to show their room to you. And that's a great way for them to pick toys. Now you can use puppets on your end or you can use, but I usually like to have them show me their favorite toy or I like to have them work in Legos or their stuffed animals or their action figures. And they'll like usually bring you something. Um, we also do artwork where I'm like, if they got crayons, we will color and talk about things. And, um, and then I ask to see their artwork and they show me and they're excited about it. So we utilize that kind of things with the um, virtual. Uh, do I work with nonverbal children? I um, do not have as much experience with that. I do have a colleague who works not quite the same, but specifically with the autism spectrum, we do kind of work on different um, things. Like I am working with trauma with the those who are able to express themselves verbally. I am trying to get them to get what's in out. Um, but as he's mentioned to me, he's trying to get them to contain what keeps flinging out back into something more organized. But um, uh, for autism, he utilizes a lot of techniques that are um, social skill building, like um, fishing and um, engagement with that, um, but also puppets. Puppets are good um, because of the social, but in terms of nonverbal, entirely nonverbal, uh, no, but I think you could. It just, you'd have to find ways to get confirmation from the child that you're sort of connecting with them. But I think you could definitely be like, if, um, you know, if what I just saw is correct, if, if what I'm doing is correct, um, you know, nod your head or do this and then you would get kind of that feedback from them. But I think you could definitely, that client could have definitely hit me with blue powers. I just wouldn't have known about the blue powers. So I may have had to try to be like, hey, what if you just zap me with your superpowers and let's try that, something like that. 
uh, oh yeah, you got to work within the rules you have. So I'm not entirely sure um, any of this stuff would ever make it past a contraband list. Um, but um, that doesn't mean if they're adults, they could tell you about their favorite toys from them when they were a child. Um, they can tell you about imaginative role plays if they had to do it again. Um, so you could just kind of make that work a little bit with, um, with just some, some tweaks to make them verbally express, um, but still imaginatively create. All right, so. Okay, I'm gonna go over the, the third one. This one has <laughs> far more <laughs> examples, but they are representations of the child's work because I firmly believe that the child owns their artwork when they work in the session. Also, I've had too many years working with custody cases or with situations where lawyers will want to get the entire record and then they interpret a drawing. So drawings and actual artwork never make it into my clinical record as a protective caution for the child. However, I interpret and describe the um, artwork in my therapeutic notes. So, okay, so artwork. This one's probably more established, but obviously artwork can represent um, the traumatic event. It can represent the healing process. It can be a way to, to assess the client. It can be a way to access the client. Um, it's for the child's ego to resolve the effects of trauma. A meaningful integration must occur. So artwork allows for that expression of the unknown, the shadow side, the unconscious manifestation, for them to be able to use the self-healing archetype and bring it all together and integrate to a point that it is resolved, okay? So in this case, let me get my, my story right here. Okay, the client was five years old and had been almost intentionally fatally harmed by a biological parent. The child was in the care of safe family members, um, but upon introduction to therapy, um, this client was very, very shut down. Um, so literally this client, when came into my office, hid under a chair and pretended to be a tiger and hiss and claw at anything that would come near. And this was probably four sessions of under the chair tiger. Um, so basically the client was very close down and just not having any of it, which was fair considering what the client had gone through. So when I was able to get out of under the chair, we began to color a picture and this client only used black, brown, and gray tones and said those were their favorite colors. I don't know how many five-year-olds you know, but that is barely ever anyone's favorite colors when they talk about it. In fact, they will try to argue with you that those aren't colors. <laughs> Right, so those are, those are the outlines and things of that nature. That's, you know, no. So um, the client was very shut down in every aspect and so we worked through art. So here's a manifestation of how, how this client drew at five years old. Very yucky, look at that, it's just yucky. So here's another way I do coloring. So I have mandala coloring sheets. So basically, which is very psychodynamic in terms of now they're very fancy with the adult coloring books, but back in the day they weren't. But I have different designs and the, the clients pick a design and color through that. And I think that's very um, helpful for them to, to work through a, a circular mandala. But here's that situation. Okay, so once I got this child out from under the chair and, and stopped being a tiger and to at least be able to do something in the room, um, which basically I sat next to the chair and just told this client things about myself, not too personal, but like, hey, I'm a therapist. I've worked with other kids like you. I like to work in sand tray. My favorite color is purple. Um, I, um, you know, um, let's see here. What do I, when I was in kindergarten, my favorite toy was blah, blah, blah. You know, that kind of sharing, not too, too much. Like she doesn't know anything about my marriage. <laughs> So, um, but then the client was able to realize that I wasn't going to attack her and was able to come out from under the chair. And so after trust was built and we did this coloring of, of these were the favorite colors, um, I could realize that this client was very shut down and this client was very 
also very limited in terms of just what they consider color and drawing with. And that's, that's really rough. So I was like, how do I get color back into this client's life? Because that seems to be a representation of no colors allowed and there's just everything so shut down. And so it seems to be very connected to me. And so what I utilized was this idea of chakras. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but it's the yoga, it's through Tai Chi, it's through a lot of different things. And I'm not promoting this as like a gospel, but I had read about this. And the idea is, is that there are these seven centers of the body starting at the bottom with red up through basically you see the rainbow, right? It goes red, orange, yellow, green, light blue, dark blue, purple. And I was like, okay. And the concept around chakras is that there's this energy that flows through our bodies, whether it's chi or whether it's, it's different things, everybody kind of has their own philosophy on that. But the idea is that trauma can block this energy from flowing correctly. And I was like, well, it's associated with colors and I need colors to flow more correctly for this client. So I kind of based my, my idea on that, okay? So each week, I had the client work in one color. So the first week I gave the client every shade of red in crayon, color pencil and marker and let them draw whatever they wanted to draw in red only. And I did this for 10 minutes and then I let them draw whatever else they wanted to draw and play in the sand train and do other such things. And then I gave a piece of homework and the homework was to draw me one item in that color. And so I would get back like, I got an apple. I got an apple for red. Um, so the next week was orange. The next week was yellow, green, light blue, dark blue, purple. Okay. Um, so there was no criteria as to what item the client chose each week for homework, but I got a lot of like food based items. Like what's orange? Well, an orange, and that's pretty fair, okay? Um, so during the free drawings initially, um, the original free drawings, the client drew people, no hands, no faces. So there's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no, it's a pretty unhappy face there. And of course was only working with the browns, the blacks, the grains and the grays and things of that nature. Yuck, this is the pretty yucky drawing, okay? Okay, so as we started working through weeks one and two, which were red and orange, um, I got apple, I got orange as the weekly homework, and then I started to get in the free drawings, she started to use red and orange in her free drawing. Not, she got rid of the brown, the gray, and the black, and just used red and orange. And all of a sudden, we had people with eyeballs and a nose, which was pretty impressive. And I was like, okay, maybe this is working. All right, when we worked through yellow, I got a banana for that week's homework. Let me see how we go through. Um, but then we got a sad mouth. So we started working with red, orange, and yellow, and we got sad mouths on our people, which I think was pretty impressive and pretty indicative of what um, the client was going through as well. All right, and then green and blues, we started to get uh, hands, smiles, and all sorts of, look at that, look at all of that. That's a very different picture, right? Um, so at this time, once we got done with blue, the client went over to the sand tray and played out the trauma of her biological parent attempting to murder her. And it was very powerful. And in fact, the client had not spoken at any point. So it actually became a mandated reported item, but the client was able to tell their story. And that was really powerful for me to be able to accept that story and for you know her to share it openly. And when we got done with purple, the client declared their new favorite color to be rainbow, which is far more appropriate for a five-year-old's answer. In fact, rainbow is the number one favorite color I get when I ask children what their favorite color is. So that's much more of I expect. I don't expect gray, brown, and black. That's just, what? That's not right. So, 
<laughs> so this client, um, by the end of two months, the client joined a sports team, made friends, overall functioning was on par for the developmental age, and the client was also able to go undergo forensic interviewing to be able to tell their story, which was really important for the court case, but also I think really important for the client to feel as if they, they were ready to tell that story before going underneath forensic interviewing. Okay. Are there any, I see some, I'm, I'm coming to the chat. My bad, I'm sorry, I'm seeing here, okay. Um, I'll watch the time, okay. Okay. Yes, foster kids. This is great work for foster kids. And in fact, um, Eliana Gill is a very gifted uh, therapist who wrote many books on art, you know, artwork for um, abused children. And that is ex an excellent resource and things of that nature as well. Um, that I kind of worked for that um, work through her books as well. She's a pretty amazing writer. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just powerful to, especially now where we're all quarantined, it's not a bad idea to get them to doing some arts and crafts because just the fact of getting into things, um, you know, like uh, now I know slime is problematic, but like air dry clay and some clays are, are very therapeutic to work with. And with adults, sometimes I recommend baking because I've read that like the kneading dough and things of that nature can also be very helpful in processing uh, emotional concerns and things of that nature. And when I read that article, I was like, oh man, women have been kneading their problems out in some bread for centuries. <laughs> but it makes sense, right? So um, anything you can get the kids to be tactile or, or do within reason of mess and cost, um, I think is very therapeutic for them to work through their process. All right, let's see any more questions. When I'm working with family court or attorneys, how do you verbalize the session so they are both helpful to the well-being of the child but also the court processes? Well, and here's the thing, you sometimes you know you're dealing with a court case, sometimes you don't know till later. So I always write my notes in the fact that, um, you know, a good basis that um, some ethical things, trainings I've had have told me is always write your notes as if you're going to read them on the stand in two years. So I try to write my notes so that I could be able to explain. I don't spend a lot of time explaining what I do in terms of theoretical process because I know that. I spend a lot more time talking about the interventions used, the client's reaction and response, and what was that? So when I look at, when I describe the drawing, I describe the colors used. I said, so, you know, when I described the, um, you know, um, client utilized scribbles of only black, brown, and gray and shared that those are the favorite colors. So that, you know, was an indication. And then I wrote like an interpretation of um, indicating that access to color may be a representation of access to emotions or other shutdown areas in this child's development due to trauma. Oh, Eliana Gill. Here, I'll type it. She's amazing. Oh, Isabel already did. Never mind. Thank you. Isabella put the right spelling. <laughs> Thank you, Isabella. Okay, let's see here. Do I have to justify my use of materials to anyone? Um, or is that based on your judgment? Okay, so twofold. First of all, I think it is based um, on what I think best fits my practice and what best fits my room. Um, you know, so some of the, I don't utilize everything like paint sometimes is a bad plan depending on what the room is like. Um, so some of that is more based on just realistic, like what can I contain? What can be done in a way that doesn't put this child in potential trouble? <laughs> You know, like finger painting is probably a bad plan. It ends up on walls and ends up on all sorts of ends up on you. So, um, you know, I utilize a lot of non-toxic 
non-stainable materials. Um, like the sand is blue and sparkly and it gets on their hands, but it just washes off. It doesn't stain clothes. It doesn't stain faces. So I put a lot of uh, thought into that in terms of utilizing art, sand tray, um, creative expressions in general, role play. Um, there's a lot of theoretical basis to use that and I am psychodynamic so I utilize that so it is theoretically based and so if someone were to question why I utilize those I have plenty of information and established theoretical foundations to explain why I do. Let's see here. Do I keep separate? No. Um, because I utilize EM, the question was, do I keep separate notes for myself and then clinical notes for the chart? No, because of electronic medical records and the standards with HIPAA, that line is getting uh, more and more indistinguished. And when um, the, the, the court orders I am seeing are for everything. And so there, there's very little, this is mine. And part of that is HIPAA um that um the medical record is theirs and so in there are sections where it can be typed up but i never i never write anything i don't expect to see on the stand i i go with that i i i don't write or um utilize anything that i could not defend to a judge with a straight face that is my ethical bar and so I'm always, it's probably overkill, but in our field, it's a protection. The more I protect myself and my practice that way, the more I actually do protect my clients from other people interpreting their artwork and their expressions who do not have the clinical training for that. All right, what time is it? Ooh, we're doing good. Okay. All right, let's see here. Okay, so variations on that chakra work I did because once it worked for this client, I was like, how can I use it for other clients, right? Because that's pretty much like, ooh, I found something that worked. I should just like beat this dead horse. So um, for every client I could potentially find, but here's some ways that I have utilized it. I have had some clients, um, some older clients, like um, six, seven, eight, respond really well to who have anxiety to fast paced coloring in these colors. And so basically like I hand them a color red and they have uh, 10 seconds to draw something in red and then orange and then yellow and then green and then blue. And, and we go really fast and they go through everything and they go through everything really, really fast. And they do this a couple of cycles and you can hear them and like exhale, they just go. And it's like they put all of that frantic energy onto the, to the, the medium. And so that's been a really, um, I found that really helpful for some children with anxiety. I've also utilized, kind of switched it up to try to have them draw like what I was more empowerment <clears throat> using the colors. So I'll have them draw like, you know, what or who keeps them safe. But we draw that in red and orange, who, what makes them brave, um, you know, what they're good at, their favorite feeling, their favorite word, their favorite imaginary item or person or place. And then purple, who do you ask for for help? Because if these are children, they should be able to identify who their support systems are. They should feel empowered, but that also part of dealing with the problem is to try to figure out what you could do and when to get help when you need it from people you trust, like your, your parents. And you don't, you know, you don't want to teach a five-year-old to become like a completely independent island. That's not how that works. So those are different variations that I have worked with. And these kind of connect to what the different chakra points are representative of. Um, so, and, you know, I'm not entirely sure if that's all workable, but, you know, people have also been philosophizing for about for thousands of years. So it could be. So <laughs> why not? And if it works for a client, then it's a beautiful thing. It's not damaging to a client. All right, these are my references. And then questions and I saw some chat but I can't I can't get to it. Oh here we go. Uh, do I use this in a modified way with adults? Oh artwork definitely. Um, but I have um, 
I have fancier like sketch pencils, the ones that are actually used by people who know what they're doing with art. <laughs> Not me, um, but like the variations in terms of sketch pencils. And I have like a little like pad that's easy to use. And so some clients, I, I will show the reference page again. Here we go. Here we go. Um, so some clients, it's really, now first of all, for teens, I think you definitely have to have something happening between you and a teen because it's just too intense to look at each other and they're still bridging that gap of nonverbal and verbal uh, development. And so a lot of times I will use a lot of just random coloring or artwork while we sketching, doodling, while we talk. Um, and so I always use that. But with some of my highly traumatized adult clients, I will have them sketch while we're chatting or they're using the Zen garden while we're chatting. Um, sometimes when they're trying to say something that's hard for them to come to terms with, eye contact is not something they always want to engage in. So sometimes it's helpful for them to be able to um, do this and just say it. And um, so that's, those are the different items that I use. Yes, I use, I utilize games as well. I think how a kid um, plays a game can tell you a lot about how they function in this world. Um, so if they're a good, you know, if they're gracious winner, well, that's a pretty good, if they're a terrible loser, that's a pretty huge indicator. If they throw fits or they try to cheat, things of that nature can tell you a lot about maybe some ways they're trying to navigate this world that isn't really working for them. Yes. So yes, um, there's a suggestion here for Ellen Hopkins. I have not had a chance to read her. Um, but it sounds like she's an amazing young adult writer. It can be very helpful. That's appreciated. Well, thank you very much. I will take all the compliments I can get. I don't take criticism. So you'll have to give those to someone else like the next presentation. <laughs> thank you. Um, so these are the, um, so these are the ones I referenced basically for the theoretical foundations. Um, Feldman here was of course the, um, this is of course the developmental theory where I brought in Piaget and Erickson. Uh, now, if you are interested in play therapy, you know, there is different types of play therapy in terms of like theoretical, but I, because I am psychodynamic, I aspire to union play therapy or JPT and, um, uh, I believe it's Eric, Eric Green here wrote an amazing handbook, which basically was, is, is really fantastic and short, which is impressive. Um, and then of course, this was the most um, non, uh, the most responsible source I could find to learn more about chakras, if someone was interested in doing that. Um, and then of course, Young directly from his Man and Symbols. Uh, work and then also from art and trauma articles that connected those in expressive art therapies with children. Um, so just to show the theoretical foundations. Oh boy, lots more chats. Okay. <laughs> oh no, well your cat's gonna have to do the quiz too for CEUs. <laughs> Oh, good. We're in good shape. So I think the, I will stop sharing so that we can have the next person. I'm not sure if the next person is here yet. It took me a couple of minutes to get on. Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. You take yeah. over then. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> yes. So maybe we'll give another minute if people are wanting to join in and we'll get started. Rebecca. Hi, Danielle. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm your room monitor. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know if someone needs to stop the recording on this present one. 
<clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure if it's just one big recording or. I think they have to stop. So, whoever the session monitor is has access to that or.